Hey there. Welcome back to another episode of The Emily Show. Today, we're taking a look inside cancel culture in academia. This is nothing new, but it is blowing up over at Yale Law School. And that's kind of fascinating to me because we've got like a law and the kids who are going to be Supreme Court clerks and then Some of them will probably become Supreme Court justices because I think three members of the current Supreme Court went to Yale Law. So this is one of our elite educational institutions. To anyone who goes to Yale that listens to this podcast, it's not meant as direct disrespect to you. It is more of an elite institutional disrespect from this scrappy little state school girl. So, It's still living somewhere. This topic makes me a little feisty, and I can't wait to hear what you think about it on social media. So before we do anything, if you don't follow me on Instagram and Twitter, at the Emily D. Baker, I can't wait to hear what you have to say about this episode and to hear your thoughts, because we're coming across these different crossroads of how Gen Z is interacting with the millennials and Gen Xers. It's not even an okay boomer at this point, because I think that most of the parties involved here are probably in the Gen X category and not in the actual okay boomer category. So we should really just get into it. Hey there, welcome to The Emily Show. I'm your host, Emily D. Baker, badass lawyer and everyone's favorite legal commentator, breaking down the legal shit in the news and pop culture stories you want to talk about. I've been a licensed attorney for over 15 years, I'm a former prosecutor, and I'm a big fan of the cursy words. So let's break it down. Okay, but before we get all the way into it, I have two quotes for today, and then we have a sponsor that I'm going to share with you. So the first quote is from Amy Chua, who we are talking about today, author of Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother and the Yale Law Professor Under Fire and everything we're talking about today. First quote from her book is, my goal as a parent is to prepare you for the future not to make you like me. And I think she carries that into her work as a professor at Yale as well. I found the second one a bit more interesting, and that is also coming from Battlehem of the Tiger Mother. Unlike Western parents, reminding my children of Lord Voldemort didn't bother me. Those are strong words. There are going to be a lot of Harry Potter references today as we get into this, because Amy Chua has actually referred to herself as Voldemort, but maybe she's more of a slughorn. More about that in a minute. First, whatever you do on the internet, you want to make sure that your privacy is protected, your identity is protected, and your behavior is protected. And one of the best ways to do that is with a VPN. And today's sponsor is NordVPN, and I'm so thankful for them. So let's talk about that for just a minute. I have changed the lights to reflect our sponsor today. And I am so happy to share with you a sponsored video from NordVPN. You're like, Emily, what's a VPN? A VPN is a virtual private network. It lets you browse the internet more privately and more securely. The way it does that is by encrypting your data and routing it through a remote server. And you can do this on a desktop, on an iPad, on your phone. You can route through over 61 different countries or through the US, Nord will work on up to six different devices with your subscription. I know, the whole family, all of the device, or maybe just yours if you're a tech nerd like me and you have all the things. You got the laptop, the computer, and the iPhone, (laughs) maybe a tablet, but you can use it on up to six devices with your subscription. Nord also has easy plugins for Google Chrome to protect your browsing, which I find very easy to use and use on my computer that I work from all day long. I also like that Nord has super fast servers and lots of bandwidth. Really important if you need to get work done and you don't wanna slow down your internet with your VPN. And not all VPNs will let you know how fast their servers are, but Nord's are super fast quick. NordVPN doesn't keep any logs and they double encrypt your data, which is ideal for protecting your data 
online. And it can help cut down on those creepy ads that seem to know what you're thinking before you're even thinking it that track you across the web. All you need to do to check out NordVPN is use the link here on the screen or click the link down in the description box. Use the code Emily D. Baker and you can get a two-year plan at a huge discount of NordVPN. They're easy to work with, easy to install, and it's what I use to browse the web securely. So I hope you check it out. And if you do, let me know down in the comments. Let's get back into the video. Let's just, let's get into it. Let's get into it. I'm so happy to be working with Nord and so glad that they sponsored this episode. And now let's get into the stories at hand. This started breaking in April. There was an article that came out in the Yale Daily News that talked about Professor Amy Chua losing her small group following allegations of parties and misconduct. Now, all of the articles that I talk about today will be linked in the show notes, in the description box. After the article came out on April 7th, 2021, Amy Chua actually released a statement to her colleagues and then the media started picking it up. And the most recent articles I've seen came from New York Magazine and The Intelligencer, which did a really deep dive into the situation regarding Amy and her husband, who is currently suspended from Yale Law School due to allegations of sexual misconduct with regard to students. So he's on a two-year suspension. There's allegations against her. She has denied these allegations. And we will talk about some of those denials as we get into this. My thoughts with regard to this, and we'll hear my thoughts all the way through because the Emily show, my thoughts, <laughs> it's like the thing. But when we talk about law school, just like when we talk about any university, the student is the customer. I mean, in high school, it kind of feels like the parents are the customer, but the student is the customer. The student is the future alumni. The student is the future alumnus donations of a building so their kid could go there. The student is the one who kind of has that service towards them. And we're seeing schools shift more and more to be student focused versus faculty focused. I'm very curious how this plays out in academia because academia is not always easy. Law school is rigorous. Not every student is going to have a great experience. Not every student is going to get the grades they think they should get or the clerkships or the internships that they think they should get. There is a hierarchy within in academia. I mean, they rank law students by class percentage based on your grades. It is part of the rigor of the profession of law. And that happens when you go into the working world too. You get ranked early on. People ask where you went to law school. Later on, it's how many cases have you tried and how many this and that. But it comes up and there is this sorting that applies to it. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all of that. I don't like putting people in little people boxes and being like, oh, you were the top 10% of your law class. I mean, which I was, but whatever. I don't like, <laughs> not even a humble brag because anyone would look at my law school and be like, uh, yeah, but not Yale. No, not Yale. Not, not Yale. <laughs> not Yale. Though it seems that pulling good grades at Yale and Harvard and the elites is probably a lot easier than at some of the not elite schools. Because when they're talking about this small group stuff at Yale, I'm like, what in the holy hand holding is happening over at Yale? Because that was not my experience as a 1L. I think my 1L section was almost as big as the entire entering class at Yale. It definitely seems like there was more grooming and handholding that's going on of the students to place them into the prestigious hallowed halls of the judiciary and the elite positions within law. But not my path. I'm I'm here on the YouTubes talking about the law things. <laughs> so it is what it is. Anyway, the student is really the customer. And I think we're going to see more and more students pushing back on academia. But I don't always know if in every instance, this is a good thing. I'm not saying in this instance, it might not be the right thing. But in every instance, you have to have professors who challenge thought and challenge norms there. That's why there's tenure. There has to be some of that to help teach critical thinking and help teach different points of view. Because if you start creating universities that are echo chambers, 
are students really learning how to navigate in the world? And that is my concern. You are going to have to navigate in the world with people who think differently than you do, with people who approach things differently than you do, who have different backgrounds than you do. And I think giving students the critical skills of emotional intelligence and critical thinking will help them do better. Um, I don't know if that always means getting rid of every unpopular professor, but it depends on why they're unpopular. So harassing students is quite different. They're alleging here booze-fueled parties. It, 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 not making me comfortable versus a professor who maybe will challenge the norms or has a politically unpopular stance. I think there's some differentiation here, and I don't know how we find the lines there because I don't think you want student bodies just creating echo chambers of their own view, but also you can't have these power disparities in law schools like this where getting the kinds of jobs you want to further the career for spending the money to go to the law school, it seems at Yale reliant on these personal relationships. And is that a problem? Well, let's see. The new dean of law, Yale Law, is not having any of this. So this breakdown from the Yale Daily News did update itself on April 8th to indicate that Chua sent a letter to her colleagues. And we'll talk about the letter where she denies these allegations. But the original story gets into the fact that Amy Chua will no longer be leading first year small groups at Yale Law School. The first year small groups are literally that. They are small groups of a handful of students that are widely encouraged to socialize with their professors outside of class time and who are supposed to be the mentors of these small groups. And we'll get into a definition of the small groups in this. What's interesting is one of the things Chua objects to very much in her letter to her colleagues is that the newspaper or students seem to receive private information from her employment file at the law school. And I agree with, I agree with her concern about that because it seems that they garnered more than just a letter from students. So early on in the article, it indicates that a letter was received by those who had raised concerns with the school, but then it seemed later on that maybe parts of her personnel file were received by the newspaper in some way as they were working on this story, which is very, very interesting. So the dean in response and in this article is quoted as saying, while we cannot comment on the existence of investigations or complaints, the law school and the university thoroughly investigate complaints regarding violation of the university rules and the university adjudicates them whenever it feels it is appropriate to do so. She also went on to say she, the Dean of Yale Law. Faculty misconduct has no place at Yale Law School. It violates our core commitments and undermines all of the good that comes from an environment where faculty respect and support students. The law school has a set of clearly articulated norms governing student faculty interactions and is committed to enforcing them. The Yale Daily News spoke to seven law students and alumni, they say, who were granted anonymity due to fear of professional retribution. This is not unique to the field of law, but it's definitely a very real consideration within the field of law and others uh, being kind of blacklisted because you've spoken up against somebody who has more connections than you is a very real thing across a lot of sectors of the profession. And I feel like this podcast is turning into let's talk about lawyers. It really isn't meant to be that, but I was just so fascinated by this intersection of a very prominent Yale professor, her husband, a Yale professor who's already suspended, and her just doubling down on this and being like, this is a witch hunt. I'm not being treated fairly. And as we know, with all things, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle, but the students are speaking up and they're not having it. And I think this is where we're going to see a generational divide where you get Gen X, who's a little bit more like, suck it up, buttercup, let's move through. And you get younger generations being like, this shit's unacceptable. Why are you all accepting this? Why does anyone think this is okay? What is happening? I'm not putting up with it. I'm not doing this. And I saw this in the workplace with, okay, boomer, with the more boomer and millennial generations and Gen X being in the middle being like, shut up, I just need to do my work and my kids are young and I'm tired. But the millennials are there now. Hello, millennials, welcome. It's not easy when you're like, ah, my kids are tired, I have to work. And then, you know, pandemic and they're homeschooling. It's, it's a whole thing. But I saw this divide there of 
people setting reasonable boundaries in the workplace and older generations being like, we never set boundaries. Why are you setting boundaries? Like that's unacceptable. Do your work, work more, work harder and, and don't complain. And I'm getting the sense from some of the professors that they interviewed with regards to this at Yale, that it's some of that too. It's like, why are you all complaining? You're at Yale. Be thankful. Stop bitching about the way things are. And we have to redefine where the boundaries are in our work, but also in our institutions. And when students feel that there is a power imbalance, I think they are more aware of the problems of power imbalance now. This is a generation that is in law school now that saw Me Too go down when they were young. And we're like, no, you don't just get blacklisted for speaking up. We're going to speak up. Clearly, there's still some fear there with regards to what this reporter is saying and granting anonymity. But the allegations of misconduct are significant. And again, those allegations are denied, but she was removed by the university. That's the action they chose to take. She is apparently on a ban from having students at her house and her husband is on a two year suspension. So it seems that this, the, the Yale power broker couple has maybe faltered a bit in the old school way that they did things thinking, oh, this is all okay. And a bunch of students going, no, th what the fuck? It's not is okay. <laughs> We're not doing any of this. And I'm sure there's students who think that the ones who are complaining are whining and are like, stop it. What are you doing? These are good professors. This is what, stop it. I'm sure there is some of that. Not everyone's upset about everything, but when there is a power imbalance, like a professor who's helping place people in clerkships, then there has to be a deeper look. And again, Chua will say in a later article that we'll talk about that some of this is backlash for her supporting Supreme Court nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, also a Yale alum. Uh, we'll get it. We'll get into it. We'll get into it more. Let's get through the original article that tipped off the minefield that we'll get into in a moment. The Daily News continues to say that her husband, Rubenfeld, is currently serving a two-year suspension from the law school following a university-wide committee on sexual misconduct investigated allegations of verbal harassment, unwanted touching, attempted kissing, in the classroom and at his home. Students have since called for his permanent removal and demanded greater transparency in the process. So there's that. That's kind of the underlying of what's going on with her husband. And then what's going on with her is that students are complaining that she drank heavily with students, remarked inappropriately about students and faculty. In the later article we're going to talk about, she would kind of spill the tea on other faculty members on their lives, question students about their personal lives, pontificate about their personal lives and intimate lives. Her husband would ask them about their intimate lives. And you know how I feel about that after last week's Emily show talking about, you know, Dave Ramsey getting all up and what people are doing, getting down. So, you know, it creeps me out. It's weird. Don't ask people what they're doing. Stop it. Unless literally you're a medical professional and that's relevant to what you're doing. Stop it. Stop asking people about this. This is not your friend group. You are a mentor and it's not okay to teach law students that people crossing their personal boundaries and asking them about their sex lives and commenting on their appearance is okay. It's not okay. It's not okay in the workplace. It's not okay at school. Your professors should never make you uncomfortable. It's not okay. It's not okay. It's just, it's not hard to not be like, oh, wow, you know, you're so pretty. It's, it's don't be creepy. We, you know what? We talked about this in the Toddy Westbrook response to the business partner lawsuit in those allegations. They talked about the shoulder rub and alleged that the business partner had engaged in the shoulder rub. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. You know the creepy shoulder rub. The, it's not okay. It's not okay. Don't touch people in the workplace unless they have told you it's okay to hug them. And even then, don't come up and shoulder rub them when they're sitting in a chair and like pin them down into their chair and rub their shoulders. You're probably not friends like that. You're probably not. Even if you think you're friends like that, you're still probably not friends like that. Don't. Let's just, let's just not. Maybe COVID is going to help set some boundaries. And maybe now people can be like, mm, COVID please don't touch me. I'm still a little weird. I don't want you to touch me. And maybe it gives people a reset on personal boundaries without getting made fun of for setting personal boundaries. Like stop being so uptight. No, if you, it's okay to be uptight at work and tell people not to touch you. Like it's, 
it's fine. It's fine. And the same should go for your law professors. I don't even, I had law professors that I really, really liked. There was not hugging. There was, you know, friendly legal banter and occasionally curse words, but there was not going out and drinking. There sure wasn't. That would have been weird. Lawyers, were y'all out drinking with your professors? Did I miss the memo that that was something that was happening? (laughs) Did I just miss it? Was it me? Was it my law school? Was this happening? I don't know. It seems odd. I mean, it seems less weird in like postdoctoral work where you're basically colleagues with your professors, but in law school, there's still that, eh, I don't know, it just seems weird to me. One recent law student told the Yale Daily News that she witnessed Chua and Rubenfeld deliberate on students' appearances, private relationships, and other topics during dinner parties that she attended at their house. The student goes on to say, quote, having been on the receiving end of that behavior, I know personally that it is not always welcome. Yup. And that it is not all in good fun. Yep. The recent graduate wrote to the news, they purport to be provocateurs, but in fact, they're just bullies. But if you want Chua's help, and she often touts how much she can help marginalized students, then you play by her rules. If that's not a power imbalance, I don't know what is. And the YouTube audience will understand the high school bullies that's going on in my head. The... (laughs) If you're not familiar with YouTube creator Gabby Hanna, there is a meme um, of her screaming high school fucking bullies, high school fucking bullies. But this is the sense I'm getting is that it's like, oh, come to this dinner party and we kind of rip on you and we kind of rip on you, but you have to be here because if you're not here, you might not get the clerkship that you want. And it's like, it's all good, but it's not all good. It's not all in good fun. And when you're so uncomfortable, but they're your professors and they're the ones who place you in jobs, you can't do anything. And that's why it shouldn't be happening in the first place because students aren't in the position to be like, hey, this is some bullshit. Stop it because then you're that person. And when you're that person, then you're not going to get the clerkships. And then you've spent all the money to go to Yale Law to to try to get the jobs that warrant the education that you received, I mean, or the connections that you have, one of the two. And then to not get that because you set personal boundaries is horseshit. And that's what they're alleging here. They talk about a letter about Chua's punishment in 2019 from the dean. So the news article got a copy of this letter, it seems, because they say in the letter, the dean explains that Chua would not teach any required courses, which include small groups for 2020, 2021, and would not resume teaching required courses until the law school is, quote, assured that the kind of misconduct alleged will not occur. And Chua agreed to a substantial financial penalty To me, that reads like a salary reduction, the amount and nature of which remains unclear. They go on to say the letter also explained that under the Dean Gherkin's deanship, Chua would not serve on the clerkship committee, the almighty, all-powerful Oz that places kids with the clerkships they want, which helps law students secure judicial clerkships. Chua told The Guardian in August that she voluntarily gave up this role and it was a pleasure to step back because she never wanted to be on the committee. It should be noted that Chua's daughter is actually a clerk for Brett Kavanaugh on the Supreme Court. Just, just, I mean, it, her daughter also went to Yale Law where she's a teacher and then ended up in some of these types of clerkships. Just food for thought. The small group controversy started over perceived throwing parties during COVID and having students over to the house, which might have been a violation of this 2019 agreement, might have been a violation of the school's COVID restrictions. But either way, the article indicates they received evidence that these parties were still happening. And at least eight law students sent emails to the dean voicing their support of Chua And those were also reviewed by this news article. They weren't expanded upon. Like the positives, whatever was in those letters sent by law students supporting Chua were not reported on in this piece at all. There was no bringing about the other side of the students that support her saying she wasn't throwing these parties. She was just supporting students in small group. And Chua says in her letter, which we're going to get into right now, in her letter to colleagues that she was mentoring students that were going through difficult times during that time. 
and not in fact hosting dinner parties. In her letter, which again will be linked below, she indicates that, quote, at a bare minimum, whatever else you may think, every member of this faculty should be concerned that confidential personal information about me has been disclosed. Personnel information. I said personal, I meant personnel personnel information has been disclosed. If a letter in my personnel file can be leaked to students, anyone's can. If the administration is selectively leaking personnel files, whether to students, graduates, or the press for its own reasons or purposes, whatever they may be, everyone should be alarmed. It's fair. It's a fair statement. I think it's also a little bit like be on my side or else because they're coming for you, but it's a fair criticism that unless there's a procedure for personnel information to be requested and then to be released that is equally applied to everyone, then this shouldn't be released. The letter goes on to share that Amy was unaware that this was coming out until on Sunday, March 28th, she received an email from Yale Daily News reporter Julia Brown, who informed her that she was, quote, working on an article about how you will not be leading a small group at the law school next year, and that, quote, there will likely be a formal announcement about it on Monday. Apparently, Chua hadn't been told this yet because the dean was not going to tell her until Monday. Monday. So she was unaware that this was coming and found out about it from an email from a reporter. So she immediately wrote to the dean. It sounds from the way she wrote it in this letter that she forwarded the email from the reporter to the dean because she wrote um, a letter to the dean and then quotes her own email to the dean in her letter to her colleagues saying, Heather, I'm so upset about this. Exclamation. This is totally false. And I feel like I'm being bullied. How did they get all this information? And why am I the last person to find out about the small group, which I didn't want to teach anyway? What should I say to this reporter? Will the school stand by me? And then there was a Zoom call between the dean, another member of faculty or the administration staff, and Amy Chua that evening. So it sounds to me like she did forward this saying what is even happening. In her letter to faculty, she says again, I am not responsible for this. I was helping students. Chua goes on to tell her colleagues in this letter that she had a Zoom call with the dean and the dean kept saying to her, this is the time for you to be candid. Did you have a federal judge to your house with students? She goes on to say in her letter, I honestly had no idea what she was talking about. I felt I was in an inquisition. I was distraught and totally confused. I kept asking what was going on. A federal judge over at my house was students. No, 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 I told her. The suggestion is not only 100% false, but paren, during COVID, ludicrous. As you may have seen, the terrible story in the Yale Daily News came out last night. I'm speechless. It's so out of sync with the truth. I don't know where to begin. And then she dives right in. She said that she racked her brain trying to think about what dinner parties they could be talking about. And she said in the midst of these events, let me tell you the events she listed for her colleagues. As many of you know, there were a number of serious crises for our students in the last few months, including a student sending racist and terrifying violent messages to other students and then disappearing. I don't know what that's about, but I have questions accusations of racism at the Law Journal, and most recently, the outburst of anti-Asian violence that has been in the news. In the midst of these events, a few students in extreme distress reached out to me, feeling they had nowhere else to turn. Many of them feeling that the law school administration was not supporting them. I appreciate that she took a moment to dig at the administration for not supporting students who were being deeply impacted by three race-related events as she lists them out, sending racist and terrifyingly violent messages, which, again, I have questions, discussions about racism on the Law Journal and the outburst of anti-Asian violence and hate. The three things she indicates in this letter are all racially related and then goes on to say that the administration was not supporting the students, which paints a picture of how she feels about the administration and was an opportunity, I think, to put a dig into this letter. She goes on to say that because we could not meet in the law school building, we met at my house and I did my best to support them and console them. One of the students had just received death threats, which as a law student should never fucking happen. And I can't 
I, I can't wrap my head around the fact that the administration wouldn't support a student that was receiving death threats at the school, but I don't know the situation. What we have in front of us is this letter. These are her allegations of how things went down. Another student was sobbing because of violence directed at her mother. Jed was not present, the husband. On my own time, I responded to students' cries for help and tried my hardest to mentor and comfort students in a time of crisis when they feel hopeless and alone. And for this, it appears, oh, here we go. And for this, it appears I am being punished and publicly humiliated without anything remotely resembling due process. So she is lamb blasting the administration for calling her out for what she perceives as her good deeds. Others are saying there were booze fueled dinner parties. She is saying, I had a few students over to my house who needed support and I was there to support them. So she goes on to detail three points that every administration member should find disturbing. Oh, they're numbered. One, confidential information about my agreement with Heather has been disclosed to the students or the press that Heather, the Dean. I like that she calls her Heather and not Dean. What is the Dean's last name? I'm totally blanking on the Dean's last name. We said it earlier, but as opposed to calling the Dean, Dean so-and-so it's just Heather throughout this whole thing. It's like, look, Heather, what are you doing? Listen, Linda, what, 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 what? listen, Linda, I'm speaking a meme today. It's just happening. Her second point was to this day, 10 days after I was removed from next year's small group roster, I still have received no explanation whatsoever from the Dean's office about why this decision was made. And three, the information that the Dean has decided to bar me from teaching a small group, again, an assignment I didn't want, which should have been confidential, was evidently communicated to the students before the school even told me about it. I understand her points. Like, I get it, but also there seems to be more context here that we do not have. We have the quote from the school, and then we have this breakdown by the New York Magazine Intelligence Art. It is a 25-page, I printed it into a PDF, it is a 25-page article that breaks down not just what's going on with Chua, but what's going on with her husband. It's titled The Tiger Mom and the Hornet's Nest and says as a subheadline for two decades, Amy Chua and Jed Rubenfeld were Yale Law power brokers. A new generation wants to see them exiled. And this article is very thorough and in-depth. It came out on June 7th. It's a very interesting breakdown into how power elite works in law schools and how connections work. This is not, again, this happens in medical schools and fellowships and residencies and dental schools. This happens in, I'm sure, in other academic settings, in master's programs, maybe not as much in doctoral programs, probably for sure, that these things happen. It's interesting to me to see some of the quotes from other professors in this article, because some of them really take a this is cancel culture coming to academia attack. And it was fascinating the way that they worded that. So this article defines that the small groups are 16 to 18 students. And that is where they are mentored directly by one professor. And that is their section for their first year of 18 to 20 students. My 1L section, I think had 150 students in it me maybe a hundred, but it was right around there. So there, there are sections where you all take your classes together and you all do everything together are 16 to 18 students. Now, I don't know if their class size is that small or if there's multiple sections per one class, but you spend your first year with this group, with your section, and you do everything together. It indicated that a lot of this centers around drinking, but that some small groups go and play softball and things like that. So it's very interesting. There was a half joking reference to it being Montessori Law School, and it does seem very handholdy for law school. <laughs> the practice of law, in my experience, does not have this much handholding, but who knows? Maybe at a more elite level, it absolutely does. We'll see. Chua goes on to talk about the fact that she wasn't even sure that law was for her, which I thought was very interesting, not super relevant to what we're talking about. But if you want to read this article, it was 
very interesting seeing her talk about it. The article goes in to talk about what the underlying controversy was more so than the article in the Yale Daily News. And they talk about the fact that text message depicts students who believed going to Chua's house would score them a clerkship, that faculty members that were spoken to by New York Magazine had mixed feelings about it all, saying, quote, there's a weird schism among the students where they want the place to be utterly transparent and utterly equitable, mused one who is sympathetic to that critique, but they want to keep the prestige and privilege that the place affords. And that is really a balance, right? Everything at law school is not going to be utterly equitable. And other professors clearly had a, a a view on that. The author goes on to say, three other professors told me that Chua is the victim of overzealous Zoomers who have confused the natural hierarchy of achievement and Chua's right to favor whomever she wants with a social justice outrage. I was very interested that that is the perception of a number of professors at Yale Law where you are really raising the next generation of change makers that it's like, no, 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 no. What we're not going to do is cancel Professor Chua. This is part of how law works. Sit down and stop being so mad about everything is how I interpreted that quote. And then we get into the taking of the cake. Quote, there are a lot of mediocre students at Yale who were superstars in their little country fairs. And now they're in the Kentucky Derby and they're not winning their races. And they feel like it's unfair because other students are doing better, says one faculty member who thinks the dean, Heather Gherkin, was too deferential to students in how she handled the small group affair. Quote, as dean, I have a responsibility to create a community in which all students can thrive, Gherkin said through a spokesperson. When a faculty member violates our rules and norms, it undermines the good that comes from an environment while faculty, where faculty respect and support our students, which was also in the other piece. I just thought it was very interesting the way the, oh, you're all superstars at your little podunky colleges, you know, Yale, Harvard, <laughs> Brown, Duke, you know, the the prestigious universities that these law students come from, you, you know, you're all winning at your little, your little universities there. And then you come to Yale, you come to Yale law and you expect everyone's going to be at the top of the class. You're wrong. You're wrong. Stop being so sensitive. You're not all going to win the Kentucky Derby. It was such a strange analogy to me, but I also get it. You can't say, well, it's not fair that these students are doing better unless there is something that is actually hamstringing the students. When law school is graded on a curve, some are going to do better, others will not. That's the way that works. Not everyone's going to win. I feel like Yale Law isn't for participation trophies. And the way that these particular deans are spelling it out makes me feel that they perceive, the deans perceive, that these students are complaining about not getting a participation trophy. And I think that that unfairly discounts the very real concerns here. But the real concerns that this article raises are more about the husband. Don't talk about the husbands. It's a real housewife reference. More about the husbands, as I now just said husbands, it's more about her husband than it is about her and it's about her kind of tangentially. And this article gets into what this initial issue might be that there was this no hosting students at the house from 2019. And she might have violated that by having students over, even if it wasn't for dinner, she might have violated that by having students over for mentorship or because they were traumatized and upset, as she says in her letter. That might have been enough. But I think what Chua took issue with was that she was being painted as having these dinner parties during COVID when that wasn't the case. But the school's been silent as to why she's been removed. So it's not, oh, no, we didn't find the dinner parties to be an issue. We said no students over the house. There were students over at the house. doesn't matter why they were there. That's the issue. It's a no-go for us. We've already disciplined this woman, and she's continuing to violate the rules. And her husband's on a two-year suspension. What we don't want are students over at their house ever for anything. 
So there are some real concerns. I think the way that some of the professors couch this as overzealous Zoomers might underlie some of the very real concerns. Again, the allegations with regard to the husband were found substantiated enough by the school that they, in fact, suspended him for two years. And this article gets into that too. The article goes on to get into Chua's self-perception. And it's very interesting to me how she sees herself. The article says, Chua, who has chosen to meet me in her daughter's old shirt and leggings with a hole in the knee, says she doesn't recognize herself in this portrayal as a power broker. It's been really an adjustment to suddenly see myself described as this incredibly connected, ruthless, powerful person that wields so much power in the clerkship process. Just a side note, remember that she said her kids thought she was Voldemort just saying she's surprised that she is being described as ruthless and powerful. She did liken herself in her book years before this to Voldemort. I mean, the self-awareness was there then even if in jest in part. Chua goes on to say, many of the things that I was encouraged to do and I was complimented for 20 years ago, like making the house intimate for small groups of people who felt they had nowhere else to turn, turned into something that, and I take responsibility for this, I didn't really understand that, oh my gosh, some people don't feel comfortable in this space, or there's more competition than you realize for these spots. I didn't think of it this way. She adds, my own self-perception is kind of as the underdog. Well, if you are painting yourself as the underdog in this situation, of course you don't see the power imbalance that could make students feel like they can't come up and say anything. But on and on and on in this article, it talks about students who wouldn't speak out about her husband because they feared retaliation from her, not just from him. And that is reiterated over and over again. Now, whether that's just a handful of students who didn't get what they wanted, it's hard to say because the allegations are what they are. And you can't just discount students saying our boundaries are pushed and there's a power imbalance here. And it's very hard to go through the process at the school because to go through the complaint process, as this article clearly points out, eventually you are made known as an accuser to the people you are accusing, the people in power who hold the keys to your professional career. There's a quote in here that talks about how it was alleged that Chua was going after people who went after her husband. She said that it was unfounded. Chua showed that she had been cleared of the allegations, but the words that she used were, I will call up every member of the Supreme court to block a clerkship for this student. Now it was, she was cleared of blocking students or of taking action against students. But her go-to was, I will call up every member of the Supreme court. You're you, you most, most can't say, let me just call the Supremes. Hold on. So when she sees herself as kind of the underdog, the access there is clear and the power imbalance there is clear. Again, her daughter is also clerking for the Supreme Court. So I can see why the power imbalance is being brought so much to light. How does academia deal with this? And I would love to hear your thoughts on how academia should deal with this. What's interesting to me is that the article also points out that small group professors get a budget for socializing. So I feel like there's this disparity and you hear it in Chua's earlier statement saying 20 years ago, I was praised for doing this, that like, she's not keeping up with changing social norms. And that if there's this budget for socializing and other small groups are getting together at local bars or someone's house, why can't she do it too? And there seems to be some of that. The article does say not all small groups drank together. Some went apple picking or played stickball. Did they also play Quidditch? I have questions. Because <laughs> Princeton kind of looks like Hogwarts. I have not been to Yale. I've been on the Dartmouth campus and the Harvard campus. They all kind of look a little bit like Hogwarts to me. Princeton more so than the others. But Yaleys, is it accurately depicted <laughs> in Gilmore Girls? Because a little, a little like Hogwarts. Anyway, there's a, a story from a student regarding Amy's husband, Rubenfeld. And it, it kind of... <sighs> 
exemplifies this power imbalance, right? It says Rubenfeld would often send out emails with the subject line emergency drinks. You know, Freudian slips are funny, aren't they? With the subject line emergency drinks. And there were lots of emergencies. He would buy the first round. One night at Cask Republic, the student who was speaking to the reporter ordered scotch. She liked scotch, but she says now that if she's honest with herself, her choice was also a performance, a show of toughness. I mean, it just, it makes me think of a Carrie Underwood song, right? Sipping on some fruity little drink because she can't shoot whiskey. I understand, like, I feel this student so much in this, like, when you're in the circle with the guys that ordering a lemon drop is not going to go, I love lemon drops. I encourage all of you to drink. They're delicious. They're delicious. But also fruity little drink because you can't shoot whiskey. So there's this perception that if you're going to be with the guys and be, you know, also be an equal, that then you have to take on these characteristics to show that you're an equal. She said that Rubenfeld was impressed. Right. And that's the thing. Ordered a second round of whiskey just for the two of them. When he drank, she remembers he would start leaning towards her, touching her arm or the small of her back as he joined a conversation or staring into her eyes. Don't ever touch the small of my back unless you're married to me or I've given birth to you. <laughs> or you're my best friend. <laughs> like, like, don't just walk up and put your hand on the small of someone's back. It's a very intimate gesture. Again, this individual's story of this, of her experience with this, but I can see it happen. I saw this happen with bosses when I was working especially when alcohol was involved. No, no. But this is, again, where that power imbalance is and how the university unwinds this culture is very interesting to me. And I think they are starting to do it. We see this couple saying that they are being unfairly, I guess, witch hunted, if you will. But also you see the dean standing by. No, our students need to feel safe and need to feel like they have access. And we're going to get into two more points and then I will wrap it up because now I feel like I'm repeating myself. But here's the thing that I was not quite aware of. The article says fully half of Yale's law school classes clerk, but not all clerkships are created equal. Yeah, that you, no shit. <laughs> I was also a clerk <laughs> and a research attorney, but no shit, they're not all equal. So-called feeder judges on federal circuit courts are the most prized because they provide the cleanest pipeline to clerking on the Supreme Court, which is not only prestigious, but lucrative. Get this, y'all. The typical signing bonus for such a clerk at a law firm is $400,000 not counting the six-figure starting salary. Six of the nine current justices clerked on the court themselves. The student did not shrink from Rubenfeld's touch. So this is really, that puts a pin in why students are overriding all of their red flags, because these are the stakes for the students at these prestigious institutions. It's all bullshit. Like, it's all this clusterfuck of who you know which is ridiculous, but that's what it is. That's what the entertainment industry is. That's what the music industry is. It's connections. It's what entrepreneurship is. It's your connections. At least in entrepreneurship, I feel like you can work your way into the right room to start meeting the people that you need to meet. But for law, a lot of meeting the people you need to meet takes place around alcohol which leads to terrible behavior for a lot of people. So I don't know how professional schools, because I don't think we're, we're drinking with professors at undergrad, but I don't know how professional schools are going to balance students' maybe overzealousness at perceived imbalances and then actually dealing with problematic imbalances. Because we know students get feisty. It's, it's what you do at that age. And you should, and they should be calling it out. But there's also got to be a balance between the integrity of the institution, not bending to every will, but also actually taking action when there are problematic power imbalances within the institution. And is this that? Is this Yale dealing with problematic power imbalances? Or is this overzealous Zoomers who are mad that they didn't win the Kentucky Derby? I want to know what you think. Thank you so much for hanging with me on this one. It's a fascinating story. I'm going to be keeping an eye on it. I've never been more interested on what's going on at Yale Law than I am right now. So I'm curious to see, is this witch hunting? Or is this 
changing with the times and making sure that power imbalances don't negatively impact the well-being of students. Let me know what you think on social media. I can't wait to see you in the next one. Thanks for hanging with me. I think we're still in a panorama ding dong. So raise a glass and let's say it. Let's say it together. Let's say it together. May your Wi-Fi be strong. May your toilet paper be plentiful. May your family be well. And may the odds be ever in your favor. I will see you next week. Thanks for hanging with me. Thanks for being all honored. Bye. Connect with me everywhere. I'm at the Emily D Baker. If you guys want to join the text, just text emily.com. If you want to join the channel, lawnerdsunite.com. Happy to have you support what we do here on the YouTube 